If you search hashtag NFTs on Twitter, you'll see thousands of free giveaways. Pretty much all of these giveaways are pump and dump schemes. Now take a step over to TikTok and you'll see thousands of Ethereum investment gurus. I want to let you in on a secret. Later this year, Ethereum will go through a triple halving. And then if you go over to YouTube and search Ethereum, you'll find these YouTubers talking about one of two things. 99% of this social media content focuses on the positives of Ethereum. Infinite gains, better technology, no trade-offs. Rather than just focusing on the positives, I want to take this video in a different direction. We'll go through how Ethereum works, we'll go through the upcoming changes to the protocol, and most importantly, we're going to go over the many risks that people overlook. Instead of my voice explaining the basics of Ethereum, we will use Naval Ravicon. Naval will do the explaining, I will do the animating. What you've done is you've built a computer in the cloud, a virtual computer, that's stitched out of thousands or tens of thousands of real computers. And that computer is very inefficient, it's very slow, it's going to move at a very slow speed. So comparing it in throughput to your home computer or to a supercomputer's nonsense is besides the point. But any piece of code running on this is very trustworthy and you know it hasn't been hacked and now you no longer need a government or you no longer need a single actor in the middle like a Mark Zuckerberg running Facebook to tell you which transactions are valid, which contracts are valid, which programs are valid and which ones aren't. You've done away with the need for trusted third parties and you've replaced it with a trusted computer that is being audited, verified and checked by thousands or tens of thousands of computers. The technological complexity comes in scaling this, making this computer faster, keeping it secure, creating incentives both economic and technological and game theoretic to prevent people from hacking it and breaking it, and having an incentive mechanism in there so that people want to add computers to this network, and also having a disincentive mechanism to use the network. You have to pay for it, otherwise you can easily overwhelm it. This giant contraption is Ethereum. This distributed network called Ethereum has marketed itself as a world computer, like an app store that's not controlled by a central party. The underlying technology used in Ethereum's app store are smart contracts. I'm not going to explain how smart contracts work because that would require its own video. Instead, here's a one sentence summary. Smart contracts replace third parties that in the real world would determine the outcome of a contract. Ethereum's complex smart contract base layer means more projects can be incorporated into the network. Some famous examples are stablecoins, decentralized finance applications, and non fungible tokens or NFTs. In theory, the sky's the limit for these applications, but the question is whether they make economic sense. And this is where we get into the risks. Are you listening? Okay, buckle up. One concern of decentralized apps is that the use case is circular and speculative. Imagine a bunch of banks taking deposit money and then lending to speculators in the nearby stock market. Then what those speculators are trading mostly consists of shares of those banks, tech companies, and stock exchanges, resulting in a big circular speculative party. The biggest use case for Ethereum so far is a decentralized version of that circular speculation-based system. So you might ask, why would this big circular speculative party become so popular? Good question. There's lots of answers to this, but a main reason that this big circular speculation party gets around know your customer regulations. Governments enforce KYC checkpoints on regulated exchanges and custodians to track who buys and sells crypto tokens. They can do analytics on the public blockchains, but to enforce tax fraud or other lawsuits, they want to be able to link blockchain transactions to specific individuals by having KYC gateways on exit and entry points. Decentralized apps make that a bit harder and are more appealing for users who wish to retain their privacy. Watch this clip of investment analyst Lynn Alden explaining why this circular and speculative system might be concerning to some investors. Any sort of kind of network effect has that kind of circular notion where the more people use it, the, the better it does. My point with Ethereum is that it's highly used for leverage and kind of these shorter term bets. And so, for example, if you look at, you know, what's all the money that's locked in DeFi? You have decentralized exchanges, then you have liquidity or leverage providers for those exchanges. And so some people can deposit stable coins, for example, and collect interest on them. 
And the other side of that is they're basically borrowing stable coins at a pretty high interest rate. You know, some of them could be using that for life expenses, but many of them are using it to speculate on different sorts of tokens, using that as to have a leverage play on different sort of tokens. And especially because some of those tokens are lower market capitalization altcoins, it's got a substantial amount of risk and speculation. And so when you're in that bull market, you can see, you know, the amount of leverage builds up, the, the amount of kind of the, the yields can be high. It's this attractive situation. But if that were to turn down into a, you know, the, the opposite of that, a bear market in alts, that's where some of that leverage could become very painful. Also, it's more expensive to run lines of code on Ethereum than it is on Amazon Web Services. There are some games or services that make specific use of blockchain technology, like enforcing digital ownership of NFTs. But other than that, many of them copy centralized companies that don't use blockchains. And something even more concerning is that there's a bunch of other protocols doing the same things as Ethereum. Smaller protocols like Solana, Cardano, Polkadot, and Tron pretty much offer similar features to Ethereum, and they are more efficient. It would be like selling lemonade at the end of your driveway. You make a ton of money, but your lemonade recipe is open source, on the internet for everyone to see. So your neighbor takes your lemonade recipe, adds more sugar, and makes it cheaper. And instead of just one neighbor opening up a lemonade stand, the entire street is now selling lemonade. They're everywhere! And each person is trying to make their lemonade sweeter and cheaper than the others. This is basically the predicament Ethereum finds itself in. To visualize this, venture capitalist Haseeb Qureshi created a benchmark that compares the efficiency of all popular smart contract platforms. So what we found is that Ethereum can do about 10 trades per second, Celo can do about 25, AVAX can do about 30, but it has much higher ceiling, Polygon can do about 50, and Binance Smart Chain can do about 200. And then Solana, which famously claims that it can do in the thousands to tens of thousands of transactions per second, Solana can do about 280. But part of the reason why Ethereum performance is where it is, is that Ethereum has enshrined a certain level of decentralization. This is important as a norm, as an institution, that we make sure that Ethereum is accessible to anybody on a laptop. And most of these newer blockchains haven't chosen that. So as Haseeb was saying, these other smart contract platforms are more centralized than Ethereum, but they all have more throughput for transactions. And now you should watch this next clip of Lynn Alden explaining the risks Ethereum faces by having these cheaper smart contract blockchains. And as you know, we've seen Ethereum fees rise over the past six months, now actually more transactions for Tether take place on Tron than on Ethereum. And there's still more value settled on the Ethereum side, but because the fees are high, a lot of the small transactions have had to spill over onto a cheaper protocol in order to justify it. Because Bitcoin, since the average transaction size is pretty high, they can handle higher fees. Whereas Ethereum, when you start to run into these high fees, a lot of these smaller transactions have to have to go off to a spillway. Users want efficiency when using applications, but efficiency is tied with centralization in the blockchain world. On the other hand, Naval makes some points on why Ethereum has been able to maintain and grow its large network compared to other blockchains. The incentives aren't there for developers to build on somebody else's blockchain. I got in trouble for saying this in 2017, but I still stand by it. There's a free rider effect on blockchains. There's a strong incentive to fork a chain and build your own rather than to build on an existing chain. There's a couple of brilliant things that maybe by accident, maybe deliberately happened on ETH that have allowed an ecosystem of innovation on ETH. There's ERC20, which is people are building their own tokens. And then there's these rollups and layers where people are building on top of ETH, and in theory, they're going to issue their own token. So as Naval said, Ethereum does have great incentives for development. If you want people to build something, provide them with freedom and rewards. Ethereum does exactly that. It's unknown if any crypto project will be successful or not, but the point is Ethereum has some major competition when undergoing a major transformation. A transformation called... This transformation is probably the most important thing in Ethereum's history. It has been in talks before the original Ethereum was even released. In a post from 2014, Vitalik Buterin said, And at this point, we fully expect we'll end up releasing Ethereum 2 at some point in 2016. 
So Ethereum 2.0 has been in talks for over eight years, and by Vitalik's initial prediction, it has been delayed by six years. Here's a quick analogy to explain the ETH 2.0 transition. Let's say there's a spaceship traveling through space called Ethereum. The Ethereum spaceship has worked well, but it's getting clunky and slower compared to competitor spaceships. The developers have been working on a new and improved spaceship called Ethereum 2.0 that will be faster and more efficient. The problem is that they have to build a new spaceship while steering the original ship. The passengers on the original spaceship can get rewarded for moving their property to the new spaceship early, and the developers created 64 booster rockets for the new spaceship. These rockets will make the ship faster and more competitive with the other ships. Of course, that's a very general overview of the upcoming transformation. It's an extremely complicated project with many moving parts, with its main goal to increase throughput or transactions. What will Ethereum look like in the next few years is a really hard question. One of the criticisms of Ethereum is that it... Whereas with Bitcoin, it hasn't changed its monetary policy since its inception. With Bitcoin, you could say to a high degree of certainty how much supply would be in existence in, say, the year of 2079. Whereas with Ethereum, it's iffy. You really couldn't say that at all. In 13 years of history, Bitcoin's monetary policy has not been changed. In contrast, Ethereum has a more flexible monetary policy, changed by key developers over time. Ethereum developers change their monetary policy as often as the Federal Reserve does. This is risky because people do not like to store value in things that they cannot predict. As an example, people don't like to store value in government currencies because central bankers can change the monetary policy whenever they want. Looking back in history and this chart, the same case might be valid for Ethereum developers. And if Ethereum developers can change the monetary policy like it's nothing, then it wouldn't be crazy to assume the developer team has a ton of power over the network. <laughs> The whole point of crypto is to not be centralized, so to start off we'll talk about the pre-mine. To understand what a pre-mine is, here's a quick analogy. Say you have a team building a communal pool in the center of town. The team says the pool will be open for everyone to use, no restrictions, and no rules. The day before the pool is released to the public, the team says the pool will have a restricted zone where nobody can enter unless they help invest in or build the pool. This restricted zone takes up more than half of the water in the pool. And now what you have is the whole town in less than half of the pool. And then in the majority of the pool, you have a select few individuals. This is basically what the Ethereum Foundation did. Currently, the total Ether supply is at 121 million tokens. So the early investors and developers pre-mined more than half of the current supply. And this becomes even more of a concern as the Ethereum 2.0 transition will be switching from a proof-of-work security model to a proof-of-stake security model. Now you might be asking, what is proof-of-stake? Good question. I already gave a full rundown of proof of stake in another video, so here's the one sentence version. The more equity or tokens you have, the more power you have over the network. So because the developers and early investors pre-mined a ton of tokens, they will have loads of power in this new system. And now watch this clip of Ethereum developer Ben Edgington. He explains how other avenues of centralization could be a problem for Ethereum as it continues to grow. Centralization is always a problem for control of the network and so on. So it's always something that we're trying to design the protocol around, not to have too many centralizing pressures. Uh, mining power is concentrated in a few pools and in principle they can cause trouble for the network. And it's the same if too few entities control the majority of validators on ETH2. And it's really hard to design around. So the goal is to make it as easy or as to disadvantage as little as possible those who wish to stake individually. I'm not sure that we're really fully succeeding at this. There are definitely centralizing pressures. There are things like, you know, if you stake with Lido, for example, you get a DeFi token back, stake ETH, STE, uh, which then you can put into DeFi and so on. And that's very attractive to people, right? Whereas my 
the uh, ETH that I've staked on my own node is completely inactive. There's nothing, derived, no derived value I can get from that. So that's really hard to defend against. So Ben was basically raising centralization concerns over validators, saying that validator pools like Lido offer incentives for users to stake with them. And in return, this gives the owners of the validator pools more and more power over the network. To highlight this problem even further, you have people on Twitter begging Lido to weaken its power over the network. And then add on to that, many people believe organizations like Lido are offering illegal securities to investors. So if a government believes Lido is offering illegal securities, they can come after the organization and all the tokens which they are holding on behalf of their clients. And on top of that, there is another risk with the centralization of nodes. A node is just a copy of the blockchain or ledger that can see transaction history. The more individuals that run a full node, the harder it is for regulators to attack the network. Ethereum currently has various levels of nodes. You have light nodes, full nodes, and archive nodes. As a comparison, Bitcoin just has one type of node, the full node, which is pretty much the same as an Ethereum archive node. The big difference is that it's much easier for a regular user to run a Bitcoin full node, whereas most Ethereum archive nodes are run by third-party operators like Infura. And now you might ask, what's wrong with third-party node operators? Good question. If or when governments decide to crack down on crypto, they could go after these centralized companies that offer large-scale node services. And since Ethereum relies on these centralized companies, the applications would be harder to use and threaten the use case of the protocol. Podcast host Peter McCormick asked Vitalik Buterin about this exact problem. How reliant is Ethereum on Infura? So I think, first of all, the Ethereum network is not reliant on Infura. Like if, if, if Infura died tomorrow, you know, the Ethereum network would uh, keep going and everyone who does have either an Ethereum full node or an Ethereum light node um, would still continue a kind of functioning normally. Ethereum applications would definitely get significantly harder to use. In November 2020, the market saw some of this risk play out in real time as Infura went down. As a result, many exchanges had to temporarily stop allowing withdrawals of Ethereum tokens and the various tokens built on Ethereum. To put it in other words, regular users of Bitcoin don't have to trust third parties as often, which is the whole point of a decentralized blockchain. And since Ethereum is attempting to do so much on the base layer of their blockchain, they really can't improve much on this node situation. If they get rid of node complexity and bandwidth, they risk having more of their market share eaten up by their competitors. Speaking of competition, let's talk about a great piece of human innovation and technology that was killed due to its competitors. <laughs> The biggest risk for Ethereum is that it could end up like the Concorde. The Concorde was an airplane, first flown in 1969, that would let the public fly at up to two times the speed of sound. While it was functional and operated commercially for over 25 years, it never became an economically sustainable project. As of 2022, over 50 years later, the public still has no supersonic commercial flight options. People in the 1960s thought we'd be in space by now or with flying cars, rather than traveling in planes that are slower than the fastest commercial plane of 1969. So while the Concorde was cool and could go from New York to London in three hours, it never worked to solve a big enough customer problem at an appropriate price. Now you might ask, what does a plane have to do with Ethereum? Good question. Remember the analogy about the Ethereum spaceship? Maybe the Ethereum spaceship will iterate and find a long-term sustainable place for itself in the Ethereum 2.0 spaceship. But on the other hand, the Ethereum spaceship could end up like the Concorde, being weighed down by complexity, competition, and lack of general economic use.